Yeah, I'm Wayne Haig, President of the Pacific Salmon Coalition. And I run all over the place looking for uh, different projects and stuff all the time. And I've got about 44 fish and game sites to uh, maintain for the fish and game department. One of the biggest things to me, well, monitoring these uh, off-channel habitat sites, but one of our big things is uh, carcass surplus from the hatcheries. They used to sell it for cat food and this and that, or they'd even bury a hole and bury these carcasses and stuff. But they're all uh, tested for any diseases they might have, and we've never had any problem with that before. We take them out, we put them into the headwaters of the streams and stuff like that and it promotes the bug life and that's what feeds all the small baby fish when they grow up. And uh, if you can keep them in a side area like that or a stream that didn't have any good nutrients before and uh, get them to the smolt stage which happens about the second or third year of their life in fresh water before they smolt out, that's when they get real shiny and bright and they're about four to six inches long and go out in the ocean and then when they come back to an adult Usually where they leave as a smolt, they'll come back as an adult. So any stream that's starved of any fish runs or anything, you actually get the whole cycle going again by putting carcasses in the stream. So it really works well. And you can go out and you can see it for yourself too. A lot of, a lot of fish in there. That salmon restoration, even steelhead, trout, any of it uh, affects uh, financial part of forks as far as the uh, motels and the cafes and all that kind of stuff. It makes a big difference and uh, things you can't control is the weather and the high waters and stuff like that and we get a long period of that and you go up and listen to the operators of these businesses and they come playing like a bugger and everything because it really knocks down their finances, you know, making any money. so. What we do just correlates right in with everything else. You know, the more fish you got, the more chance of catching the fish, and here come the people from all over, you know. So it makes a big difference. I would say we do five to ten major, you know, restoration projects a year. And then smaller ones where we're, we're doing a repair on this other thing, which is still a project, but uh, maybe another 20 to 30. So I mean, it could be anywhere from 10 to 50 projects, depending on what you wanna, what you wanna qualify as a project. We have initial contact, um, which is the landowner comes to us. We go to the landowner. In other words, we see a project that looks interesting to us, and then, you know, whatever it might be. Oh, this pipe's too small. It's obvious there's fish not getting through. You know, it's got a five foot drop on the outfall side. There's no way fish are getting through here. But there's another mile and a half of habitat really piques our interest you know it's like hey we want to get in there and change this we look at that assess the project see if it's doable communicate with the landowner whomever it might be and say hey um, is this something we can do and you know if the landowner shows interest which is really important then uh, we start moving forward um, we're still moving forward everything you know hasn't got shot down yet um, once the design is done we send the design into Fish and Wildlife. Once we know we're moving forward, we'll try and have a site visit with everybody. That would be Fish and Wildlife, us, the tribe who's involved, and a WDF and W rep. And usually, that, again, that's Dave King. Everybody says, feasible, let's go ahead and move forward. Then we start, We you know, by this time we have a pretty good design, at least a rough design everybody can look at and say, yeah, that's a good design, we'll, we'll buy off on that. Final designs are made, sent off to Fish and Wildlife. Um, in this case, again, operating the premises, uh, UNA, um, that would be Chris Burns. Chris comes out, takes looks at it. Um, he gets a design that he approves or rejects, also goes to the county uh, for shorelines. Those permits are issued. Sounds very complex, and it really is, because <laughs> you got to get a JARPA, which is a joint application resource permit. Anyway, it's like a more complex hydraulic permit. So the county and the state of Washington, Fish and Wildlife, have to both buy off on it. And then uh, once all those things have happened and all the forces come together and you say, yeah, this is a good project, you can do it, you have your permit in hand, which is pretty important because otherwise it'll get slapped. And uh, then you have to go through a bid process to hire a contractor to do the work. Once you've gone through your bid process, you find your contractor, 
you decide on what the bid is going to be or what it's going to cost to have him do it. He comes out and does the work. The work's done. Yeah, then you have to monitor it. And you've got to monitor it for years to make sure that the work you've done did what you said it was going to do. Pretty complex. <laughs> it takes a long time. A lot more planning. I mean, it might take me a week, two weeks to do a really, you know, really intense project. Three days, two weeks. I mean, anywhere in that range. It might take me one year to six years to plan for it. So it's a lot of planning. And then it's just like, you know, build up, build up, build up. Pop. <laughs> and then you're done and you move on to the next one. So it's a lot of lot of planning. More planning than actual process. So.